Kyle Rittenhouse has made his first public appearance in an interview with Tucker Carlson, where he made several statements that has people shocked, to be completely honest, but also eager. In this story from the New York Post, Kyle Rittenhouse accuses Biden of malice and defamation, but the language used by Kyle Rittenhouse was particularly interesting. Kyle Rittenhouse said of Joe Biden's smear that he was a white supremacist that this is actual malice. Now, that doesn't sound like Kyle Rittenhouse is speaking regular old English. Sounds like he's speaking legalese because actual malice is the standard by which you would sue somebody for defamation, which uh, signals to me Cal Rittenhouse was probably briefed on the potential for defamation lawsuits. He's probably already speaking with many individuals about defamation lawsuits. And uh, we're probably going to be seeing many defamation lawsuits. Here's the interesting thing. There's uh, we talked about this yesterday with a couple of lawyers proving defamation, or I should say winning on, on defamation grounds. If you're a public figure is very difficult. And Kyle Rittenhouse is arguably and always has been an involuntary public figure. It's what they tried doing to the Covington kids. I don't know if that will fly, but so long as he is out there giving public statements and appearing on Tucker Carlson. Yeah, he's he's probably going to lose on that one if he tries to argue he's not a public figure, but he may still win. The interesting thing here is that with actual malice, you have to prove that the person who defamed you knew they were lying or that what they did was, and, and this is not the legal term, gross negligence. Now, the legal, legally, gross negligence is actually a low standard legally. I'm saying that colloquially. What, what this means is, as it was explained to us by Riketa Law last night and Cash Patel, basically, you have to prove that this, the, the typical standard a news organization has for researching and fact checking was not met in this particular case. So if someone says, you know, you stole a dog or something ridiculous and you're a public figure, you have to either prove they didn't do their standard procedure or they knew they were lying. I don't think it's actually that difficult. I think the big issue is that most people just don't sue. And it's about time people started suing. This is why the the establishment, the media despise James O'Keefe and Well, let's just say use a nefarious and malicious tactic to try and take him down because James O'Keefe is effective. He does a really good job going after these the the liars and the scammers and the grifters, and he wins. I think he's won every single time. I I believe he did settle out of court before the the official formation of Veritas, but I believe as an organization, I could be wrong, they've never lost. I, I think that's true. I think that's true. You see, Project Veritas sues the New York Times. What happens? Well, someone leaks the privileged communications of the New York Times. Uh, I'm sorry, privileged communications of Veritas to the New York Times, which uh, disadvantages Project Veritas. I hope that Kyle Rittenhouse sues Joe Biden and everybody else, because I want to explain something to you. This is how I described it last night. After the show, we're talking. And I said, the, everyone keeps saying it's impossible to win defamation cases. The president of the United States showed a picture of Kyle Rittenhouse and referred to this video, these people, as white supremacists, many of whom in the video were. But he put Kyle Rittenhouse in that video. And that was just completely unfair, considering uh, one thing Kyle Rittenhouse said, which um, was why I said some things were shocking. He said he supports Black Lives Matter. Now, I think a lot of people on the right are shocked and surprised by that. I don't think it matters all that much. And personally, I believe Kyle would uh, it would be smarter of him to stay away from the polarization, you know, criticizing one side or the other. However, it's probably impossible considering he's only got one side to sue. But this is what's interesting. What, what happened in uh, that night in Kenosha was this. A, a white man screaming the N word attacked a Black Lives Matter supporter who I believe is part Hispanic, they say, uh, while screaming the N-word. And uh, this this BLM supporter fired in self-defense. But somehow we live in wacky world and Rittenhouse became the bad guy. Isn't that weird? Rittenhouse was rendering aid to the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, protesters. He said on Tucker Carlson, he supports Black Lives Matter. It's fascinating, isn't it? I don't think it matters as far as I'm concerned. My, my, my defense of Rittenhouse was based solely on his right to keep and bear arms and defend himself from these lunatics. I also support Black Lives Matter's right to protest. And so I'll put it this way. I don't support their movement. But if I see a group of people out in the street protesting and waving signs, I would say I support that protest. I don't support their ideals, 
But I absolutely defend their right to protest. And I think, you know, this is probably where Kyle Rittenhouse is. All the peaceful protesters are justified, constitutionally protected. Rioters, not so much. So what was happening? Kyle Rittenhouse was rendering aid to people who are out there protesting, regardless of who they are, what they were doing, even though there are people in a violent riot. And he was also protecting himself from violent rioters. Seems to make a whole lot of sense. Now, I want him to sue. And that's what I was saying. Imagine, I want you to imagine this, one of my silly analogies. Here you go. The establishment sits behind a large castle wall. And outside the castle wall, thousands of people armed with bows and arrows and trebuchets. And this is the analogy of the great battle against the evil king and the people, the, the people are revolting. And all of these people standing outside the, the evil tyrant's gates, and they look at each other and say, I have but this bow and arrow, and there's no way I can take down this great castle walls. So they don't. They don't bother. But what would happen if every single person yelled, charge? Yeah, they'd easily breach the castle and go in and, 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 and conquer the, the, you know, the, the castle or whatever. The point is, when it comes to the real world, when it comes to people um, actually trying to win political battles— First of all, I think the big mistake a lot of people make is, and a lot of people talk about this, you know, violence is not going to work here. There's, there needs to be a concerted legal effort. When it comes to defamation, imagine if every single person sued the New York Times, they would be like every person defamed by them. They would be buried, absolutely buried in lawsuits, legitimate ones. And they'd it'd be impossible to defend against. They would be completely overwhelmed. But because they keep telling you, and this is what annoys me the most about people on the right. I can't tell you how many conservatives and libertarian types and and moderate, whatever, anti-establishment people have been like, look, man, it's just not worth suing. It's too hard. It's too expensive and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, shut up. If you have actionable, uh, 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 an actionable claim, file it. Project Veritas did. They're winning. And the New York Times resorts to publishing privileged legal communications in a desperate bid to do something. Look, a lot of people have said to me like, oh, why don't you file, Tim? Why don't you file these? They're very careful. So I want to make sure I'm being clear here. As it pertains to me and the many hit pieces, not actionable. If I had actionable claims, I absolutely would file, file, file lawsuits. Because I'll tell you this, I'm willing to bet if someone published false statement of facts with, with a, that, were, that was actionable and I did, hey, we're going to do a fundraiser like Veritas did, I'd probably raise enough to just send the lawyers out and I didn't have to worry about it. But you got to understand that a lot of these smears and a lot of these hit pieces are clever. They're very clever. They'll say things like, there's one article that said, you know, Tim Pool is the new poster boy of ivermectin. That's not actionable. It doesn't mean anything. Even though I've been critical of ivermectin, neutral to slightly positive, even though, again, talk to your doctor, I've not been an advocate for it. Not a single time. In fact, when I got sick, I said I did not want it. Yet they, they say he's a poster boy. What does a poster boy mean? Other people look at me. I support. Who knows? Who knows? So that's not actionable. I can't. It's a meaningless statement. Of course, we know it creates an inference among, among you know, among the audience, and we know what they're trying to do. There's nothing I can do. This is what frustrates me. I sit staring at these smears, and I'm like, can't. Kyle Rittenhouse can. Why? Even after the trial, many of these news organizations said he crossed state lines. This is where it gets good. Now, they'll, they'll try and make an argument for it was widely reported that he crossed state lines with a gun. It's a false statement of fact. Easily actionable. They're not saying he's the poster boy of crossing state lines with a gun because that would not be actionable because they'd be like, oh, yeah, we know he didn't. We're just saying that because everyone thinks it. He's like the main guy when, 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 when referencing crossing state lines with a gun. Then they'd be like, it's an opinion and its meaning is nebulous. No, no, no. They, they outright said he did this and they say it over and over again. Now, here's the best part. If Kyle Rittenhouse files suit on that grounds against every media company, he can't lose. It would be impossible for him to lose. Now, now hold on there a minute. The, the case may get thrown out. Yeah. The judge may uh, say uh, dismissed. Rittenhouse may actually get no money from it. But he can't lose. You know why? This is a false statement of fact that anyone who spent five seconds on Google would have realized. 
That means in order to get that defamation claim dismissed, they would have to argue that it is not within their standards to actually research anything. Let's be real. The, the, in order to, to get a, a, a dismissal, you have to, uh, or, or, in order to win, to get past a motion to dismiss or a summary judgment, you have to prove, or, or uh, I don't know about prove, but get to the point where it's reasonable to believe that their claims against you did not follow their typical standards, meaning it was, you know, below their threshold for what they would normally do. That's how it was described by, by I believe, Ricada. So if the New York Times says, we're going to do a story on Donald Trump and we need to get sources and confirmation and stuff, and then Donald Trump says, I want to sue, they say, look, we fact checked this. It went to our editors. It was triple fact checked. Here's our sources. You can't sue us. But what happens when they say, look, when we falsely claim that Kyle traveled across state lines with a weapon, we followed all our standard procedures of doing nothing. Get it? They're going to say, what procedure procedure did you follow to uh, get the information that he crossed state lines? Uh, we did nothing. I just heard it. Is that your standard New York Times? Um, maybe not the New York Times. Maybe that's a bad example. But, uh, uh, you know, the independent, I believe they have a, a U.S. office. What was your standard when you claimed that he shot three black men? Did you look at the court proceedings at all? Did you Google search the people who were shot? You didn't. Is it standard practice for your news publication to do zero research before making claims? It is. You see, either they will admit that they have zero standards and they don't fact check and that will come out in these court proceedings or they'll say this one time we didn't do it and then they will lose the case. The New York Post reports Kyle Rittenhouse slammed Biden for defaming his character when the president tweeted out a video suggesting the teen is a white supremacist. Quote, it's actual malice defaming my character for him to say something like that. Interesting. It's actual malice. Sounds to me like he's been having many conversations about defamation, which is really interesting to see where this goes. Well, we've got more from Fox News. Kyle Rittenhouse recounts Kenosha rights, reacts to media portrayal of trial in his first interview since acquittal. In an exclusive interview with Tucker Carlson, as we know, he was uh, acquitted. I'm not really sure where the police were. I, 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 I know we understand a lot about what happened that night, but I'm, I, but I'm, interesting. I'm interested in to see what his uh, view on media is. He does mention, he says, I was in jail for 87 days. Lynn Wood was raising money on my, beh- on my behalf, and he held me in jail for 87 days, disrespected my wishes, put me on media interviews, which I never should have done, along with John Pierce. They said I was safer in jail instead of at home with my family. Wow, that's a bold statement, and that's disgusting if that's true. We've had John Pierce on Timcast IRL. If that's true, that's a horrifying thing. Rittenhouse said that at one point, Pierce claimed Rittenhouse was in an unorganized militia, which Rittenhouse called blatantly false. False. I didn't know what a militia was. I was like, what the heck? And I'm like, no wonder people are saying I'm I'm in a militia. It's because he painted the narrative. The 18-year-old, however, conversely painted his eventual counsel, Mark Richards and Corey Shirafisi. Rittenhouse told Carlson he in some ways did not believe he was a person truly on trial given the way the case was covered. That's right. It was the right to self-defense on trial. If I was convicted, no one would ever be privileged to defend their life against attackers. Apparently, to to many people on the left, it is criminal to protect your community. He then goes on to mention being called a white supremacist. Uh, He says his fellow New Yorker, Jared Nadler, a U.S. congressman from the Upper West Side who chairs the Judiciary Committee, questioned publicly whether the Justice Department should investigate the precedent. Pundits in the liberal media, including Joe Reed, Tiffany Cross, and Ali Mistel, also condemned Rittenhouse. Mistel, an attorney and writer for The Nation who frequent, uh, frequently is uh, an MSNBC guest, wrote a column claiming the teen has gotten away with murder as predicted in a white justice system working as intended. Let's talk about the media response. So I think Kyle gets it. And I think we may actually see many defamation cases. But take a look at this from The New York Times. Saturday Night Live weighs in on the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. This is actually one of the weirdest articles I've ever seen. And perhaps it's normal for The New York Times that you're not aware of it, that they do a a recap of the SNL propaganda you may have missed. So I saw this story and and I thought it was interesting that they're talking about Kyle. And of course, they're getting it wrong and falsely framing everything, making jokes based on lies, reinforcing the lies because they're morons. Um, or it's intentional, whatever. It's probably intentional. Or I think a lot of them are morons to be maybe a little mix of both. You know, they're, they're idiots and they're jerks. I'll put it that way. The interesting thing about this article, though, 
is that it just does a recap of all of the weird political segments that were made by SNL. Just like make we, we got to make sure when you wake up in the morning, you read the article so you know what propaganda you missed. Check this out. They weigh in on Kyle Rittenhouse's verdict and they say they go on. They talk about it. They smear uh, Judge Schrader saying that um, he, he says he was an, he, he says he was impartial as a dance mom clapping harder than anyone. Day says that the rules he followed during the trial were all standard procedure. That's why I ordered the prosecution not to use the word victims. They were rioters and they weren't shot. They were good doinked. By the way, I did not give my client an unfair advantage in any way. Strong asks, do you mean the defendant? Oh, yeah, sure. I keep doing that. The judge was biased against Kyle. Fact. It's true. He wasn't a bad judge, but he was absolutely favoring the defense. I'm sorry. You see, there he is. He was favoring the prosecution, not the defense. How? There were several rulings that should have gotten this case thrown out on mistrial with prejudice that even the judge screamed the prosecution over and the judge did nothing. The judge allowed it and said, well, you know, we'll see what the jury, jury does. He refused to rule on it. He gave that he gave the state. I mean, he, he, he intimated putting the, the, the prosecutor on under oath because the prosecutor gave manipulated evidence to the defense, crippling their ability to make an argument. It's only by the good graces of the facts of the case that Kyle Rittenhouse is not in prison and the judge let the prosecutors get away with it, at least for now. I don't think the judge is going to do anything. I think the judge was letting the state do these things and the media makes the portrayal, be it, fa- be it the news or the comedy after the fact, they make it seem like the judge was biased in favor of Kyle. Here, here we go. They brought out two liberal commentators, Chloe Feynman and Chris Redd who saw the verdict from very, very different perspectives. I was shocked, Feynman said. You were? Red responded, because I wasn't. I've never seen anything like it before. I have many, many times. This is not who we are. I feel like it kind of is, Red answered. You see what they're doing? They're playing to a specific narrative. It's interesting. Let me, let me, let me I can break it down for you. First of all, the jokes they're all putting out are funny if you are in the false, uh, in the fake news bubble, if you believe the lies, because these jokes to me make no sense. I feel like I've I've never seen anything like it before. Uh, I have. You have? Uh, A Black Lives Matter supporter rendering aid to protesters attacked by a a convicted child abuser, to put it mildly, and uh, firing in self-defense. And you've seen that before. It's remarkable how Kyle Rittenhouse says on TV he supports Black Lives Matter. It's remarkable how we have video footage of him rendering aid to Black Lives Matter supporters. It is remarkable then that the media says he's a far right white supremacist. These people live in that ridiculous world. Then we have this segment here. It actually was really funny, but kind of sad. Republican or not, they're so close to figuring it out. You see, the people who watch this segment, Republican or not, uh, uh, they live in the matrix. And they can see a little bit outside, but they're completely unwilling to actually talk to the people who are on the other side of that window. Or as Breitbart put it, the other side of the fire. Republican or not, a guy comes out and he says things like, you know, I buy food on a farm. And then one of the comedians goes, "Uh, because you have to or because you want to? Or because you want to or because you have to? And they're like, I don't know, figure it out. It's a game show where someone makes statements and you have to figure out if it's a Republican, the person's Republican. A woman comes out and she's like, I was outraged over my teacher, uh, over a book my school was using to teach my kids. And then they're like, aha, that is a Republican because they're complaining about books in schools. And he goes, wrong. It's a liberal. She was complaining about the Bible. It's a good point. Like they almost see it. But there was one funny part. One guy comes out and he says, I hate cops. And they're like, oh, clearly this guy is a liberal. He hates cops. And, And then the host goes, wrong. He was talking about these cops and he shows the Capitol Police. And I'm just like, it's so weird that you can actually get to a point where conservatives were uh, throwing the Blue Lives Matter flag in the dirt and stomping on it at a protest because police were screwing with them. That you've got videos out of Portland and Seattle where police were protecting Antifa and, and conservatives were like, what are you doing? And you've got overt criticism for a year over the COVID lockdowns from conservatives, because more and more conservatives are actually coming out saying that they have issues with the police. Just uh, last week, Jack Posobiec said the police, you know, uh, he said the state lies to protect its interests. We watched police push 
I'll, I'll say this, false framing and manipulations, what I would believe to be our lies on the stand to prosecute and convict Kyle Rittenhouse. The state sought to put an innocent kid in prison for life. And that was all thanks to the police. It's the police who take your guns, the police who kick your door in over COVID violations. It's the police and the military in Australia round people up. And conservatives are waking up to this. Yet they're just not there. They're close, though. And it'll be interesting. The best part of this segment, I got to be completely honest, the best part was the end where Liz Cheney walks out. Absolutely great bit. Maybe they don't really get it. Liz Cheney, why isn't why can't I get a frame with Liz Cheney? In? Liz Cheney walks out and she's like, I was uh, I've been an elected Republican for years, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, eh, something's wrong here. This whole game show has been weird. And then the host is like, figure it out. And then she says, I'm a Republican. And they go, bam, she's a Republican. And then the host goes wrong. The Republican Party voted to remove her from the GOP. She is no longer in the Republican Party interesting. It's almost like that should be an important point that many of these, you know, liberal SNL viewers should understand. What they think Republicanism is, has been literally kicked out of the party. This is a great symbol. He's like, this is the daughter of Vice President Dick Cheney. And she was voted out of the GOP. She was booted because she's not a Republican. You know, She may have been 10 years ago, but Donald Trump and his crew, they took over. And the funny thing is, Donald Trump's populist wave has more in common with left populists than either do with the establishment. But the only way they're going to keep everybody tangled up is to make sure that the left supports the Democrat establishment because Trump is evil and fascism and all that other nonsense. Now, I'll tell you this, the Republican establishment is no different. It is awful. It is disgusting. But the populists on the right have a stronger foothold. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. That being said, I think didn't Matt, I think Matt Gates mentioned that there, he's forming a new political party. Good. No, seriously. I, I, I think this is big. I think Matt Gates has enough clout in his district to actually win a third party run. I mean it. I mean it. He's, he's massively famous. But we'll see. We'll see. It may just be, you know, pol- a, a political career ending move. I don't know, though. What I would say is that when it comes to 2022, forming a new party doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Primarying Republicans and getting in populists does make a lot of sense. The Democrats should do the same. Uh, I should say I should say the progressives should, because I think at the end, while most of the leftists and the right disagree on a lot of issues, I think it's fair to point out we agree where it matters. And where does it matter? Well, uh, uh, the leftists, like the real ones. And the, the left populace and the right populace, very pro-gun together, okay, very anti-establishment, very anti-elite, very anti-corporate and government. I'm like, mm. you know, there's been a big libertarian wave on the right. And the problem I, th- I see with the leftists is that eh, they're kind of authoritarian in a lot of respects if they're fairly communist. And, uh, you know, they'll say the right populists are fascists or whatever. So I'm kind of like, you know what? I'll step back for a minute and just say, I would love it if the left populists, not AOC, like the actual leftists, you know, uh, people who follow Vosh, for instance, you might, uh, Vosh or however you pronounce it, you might not like the guy, he's got some questionable statements and all that stuff, but he's pro-gun. So if uh, more Democrats get in, and they may have ridiculous dumb views on the economy that we don't like, but if they're pro-gun, I'll take it. I got to be honest. Look, if I have the choice between some corporatist Democrat establishment or a Liz Cheney, and then I get some crazy guy who's like, I want to be left alone and have guns and I want communism, I'd be like, well, I'll vote against the communism thing and I don't like you, but the establishment already is fascist. So I wouldn't really be trading up or down having an authoritarian. But if you're going to let me, you know, if you're going to vote for gun rights, I can work with that. I can work with that. That being said, if the uh, uh, leftists do gain power, yeah, they're for gun rights until they're in power, then they take your guns away. But I'll differentiate between the establishment. And, and I'll say this, Hillary Clinton and her, 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 you know, her political faction, they're fascists. Like, you know, it's not the right word, it, it, you know, neo-global fascist, maybe. They're authoritarian elitists who want to curtail your rights. I do not like them. And uh, I, would, I would prefer it if that whole thing, like, lost. Then you have like 
you know, hard leftists who are socialist or communist or whatever. And I'm kind of like, think about it. If you've got an authoritarian already in power and then you've got another authoritarian trying to get in power, you're not really losing or gaining anything. But at least one side might be like, we don't like the same people you don't like. You know, the establishment elites and the corporations, these are all like really, really bad. You know, seeing like Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson be like, and, and Steve Bannon, the elites are ripping you off. You know, they're, they're stealing money from the middle class. I'm like, it sounds like an Occupy Wall Street rally. So maybe we need to get those people to vote in the same direction. And the real issue is populism for the people, not the elites. Anyway, I don't want to go too long. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 1 p.m. on this channel. Thanks for hanging out, and I will see you all then.